Good afternoon. I'm Commander Jessica McNulty, and I'll be facilitating today's press briefing on the Department of Defense's award of the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability JWCC contracts. Today, we have with us the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer John Sherman, Air Force Lieutenant General Robert Skinner, the Director of the Defense Information Systems Agency, DISA, the Department of Defense Deputy CIO for Information Enterprise, Ms. Lily Zelicki, and the DISA Hosting and Compute Center Director, Ms. Sharon Woods. Before we begin, I'd ask that you please keep your phones and laptops muted unless you're speaking in order to prevent feedback and distractions. Keep your questions, please, to one question and one follow-up. We do have a lot of people on the line. I'll do my best to call on as many people as possible. With that, Mr. Sherman, sir, the floor is over to you for opening comments. Good afternoon, everyone. And as noted, I'm John Sherman, the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. I'm very honored to be with you here today to talk about our recent award of the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability Contract, or JWCC. We made this last night to four companies, Amazon Web Services, Google, Microsoft, and Oracle. This is a huge day for the department and what we can bring to our warfighters, particularly for areas like Joint All Domain Command and Control, JADC2 we've talked about, being able to provide that undergirding of the cloud computing that's going to be there for the combatant commands and many others there to be able to have the joint warfight with the capabilities they need. Getting to this award is a culmination of 17 months of really hard work by a joint team here. Y'all might remember we announced this back in July of 2021. And this joint team, with the first being under DISA, under General Skinner's uh, authority here, working with Ms. Sharon Woods, our team and CIO, under Ms. Zelicki, and then the Washington Headquarters Services as well. But it's been a team effort with others involved as well, acquisition and sustainment, OGC, and many others. And it's been a, been a lot of work to get here, and I'm proud of where we've landed here. Now, briefly before I turn it over to my colleagues, just a little bit about JWCC. What does this bring to us here? First thing is, it brings us really cutting edge cloud capabilities to the entire department here. With the commercial sort of capabilities, those four companies I just talked about, bring to us into the fight here that we need to have. Very importantly, it brings us cloud computing at all three security classification levels, unclassified, secret, and top secret. Now, we've got other types of clouds here within the department, but none of them do this at all three security classification levels, spanning the entire enterprise from the continental United States all the way out to what we call the tactical edge way out, whether it's Western Pacific or Eastern Europe or on board a ship. And that tactical edge piece is very critical for our warfighters, whether it's, as I've noted, on a small coral atoll or somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa or somewhere else. And also, with what this brings us, is direct access to these cloud service providers. Without going through an intermediary or a reseller, this creates for more efficient and effective leveraging of these capabilities. And this is something we're very excited about. So we're, we're leaning forward on this. This is a big day in the Department of Defense. It's been a long, long journey to get here, and I'm very proud of what the team has done to provide this capability to the Department of Defense. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, General Bob Skinner. Bob, over to you. Thank you, sir, and good afternoon, everyone. What, what an exciting day for the department and be able to have a, a, a discussion on uh, joint warfighting cloud capability. As Mr. Sherman said, this has been a 17-month effort, and it could not have happened without the great teamwork um, throughout the entire department, whether it was the DOD CIO team, the DISA team, uh, Washington Headquarters Service, um, the intelligence community also played a key part in this as we're working through joint joint use agreements. Uh, just a very um, cohesive and collaborative effort throughout the, uh, the the entire effort. As Mr. Sherman said, I mean this this is a one of its first of its kind cloud capability um, contract that allows us to go from, as he mentioned, strategic to tactical. It allows us to have a multi-vendor, multi-classification, and going directly to these cloud service service providers, which, which um, there's nothing there today that, uh, that enables that. And it's done by a great team of, led by Sharon Woods, Ryan MacArthur, and others. The other part that I think is really important is um, the things that we are working on is not just this, this cloud capability vehicle. We're also really developing an environment. Um, and that environment includes some great accelerators, as we call them. Um, those capabilities that help enable our mission partners, those warfighters, 
uh, to be able to leverage cloud a lot more than what they are today. And one of those accelerators we, we talk about is infrastructure as, as, a, as code. Um, and what that does is that really that allows you to have pre-configured templates so that those who may not understand the cloud technology as well as others can use these pre-configured templates and really be able to leverage cloud in a much faster environment. We also have a, a cloud provisioning tool that enables them to actually help manage accounts, manage how they are leveraging that cloud capability. And then the final one is this uh, capability called Vulkan, which is a DevSecOps environment that allows us, whether it's you know, using Jira, Confluence, and other GitLab type capabilities, that really allows this an environment to whether you are an expert in cloud technologies or a beginner, it really helps all of you be able to leverage this a lot more than what it is today. Um, and if you look at this, as Mr. Sherman said, if you look at this as one of many things that are going on within the department, as we improve the transport uh, layer and, and how we're transporting data, the integrated data layer that, uh, that you've heard department leadership talk about, those along with this cloud contract and JADC2, which is the applications of the command and control that will be leveraged, all those together really improve the resiliency, the capability, and the readiness of the apartment across the board in support of those war fighters, whether they're at the strategic level or down in that foxhole, as Mr. Sherman said. So look forward to your question, and I'll turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you, sir. We'll start off with Associated Press, Tara Cobb. Hi, thank you for doing this. Um, so when the original contract uh, was canceled, at the time you'd mentioned that because of the delays it had no longer, it no longer addressed all of the needs that you had in the cloud. So can you talk about what this new contract is addressed that the old one didn't, and then I have a couple of follow-ups. So I'll start with this and then turn it over to my colleagues. It creates more offerings different kind of best athlete capabilities with the multi-cloud, multi-vendor approach, which is now common throughout industry and elsewhere. The single cloud, single vendor approach, which was comprised of the predecessor attempt with JEDI, and also in the intelligence community a number of years ago, was proper for the time in the 20 teens, but the state of technology has progressed and our cloud conversancy here within the Department of Defense on how to leverage cloud has matured extensively since that time. Also, it creates greater resiliency, having more than one vendor, more than one capability there, and it also creates some price competition within that. So for all those reasons, and this isn't new within industry and so on, we were just getting to where the state of the art is to be able to have this multi-cloud, multi-vendor capability. And I'll turn to my colleagues to amplify anything they'd want to on that. Sure, I would just add in the area of uh, classified cloud computing services and tactical edge cloud computing services, that that's a specific area where industry really evolved over the last couple years and across all of the cloud vendors. And so it made more sense to pursue a multi-vendor strategy where we could get access to the full suite of capabilities. Okay, just uh, one follow-up. Um, do you one day envision that everything DOD is going to be on the cloud? Like if you're at a forward base and there's inventory data or inventory list, are those going to be on the cloud or what things would not be on the cloud? We're always going to be in what's called a hybrid environment, just because of how big our enterprise is, the sort of applications we have where many things are on the cloud and we're pushing hard that way, but not everything will be on the cloud. Now, maybe my successor many years from now will sit up here and say we are completely off of a hybrid environment, but I think for the foreseeable future. A lot we're going to be pushing towards the cloud, but it won't be everything all the time. Bob, what would you add to that? I, I would just offer, it really goes back to what the mission partner requirements are. Um, and if, if, the, if the commercial cloud is able to satisfy that, we're all in. If it requires an on-prem capability, as Mr. Sherman said, if there's a hybrid environment, we want to be flexible to ensure that we're meeting that, the, the warfighter needs. The other thing with JWCC that I think is really important is each task order is going to be competed. So while we have discounted pricing already within the whole overall construct, each of those task orders will be competed, and therefore we could potentially receive even additional cost savings as we go forward, meeting those, those, those needs of the warfighter. Mike Stan from Borders. Thanks, so that task order being completed, that's interesting. So there's four vendors, is there gonna be some sort of electronic marketplace where you put a task order in and they bid each other down through an AI system, and you've got these $9 billion not to exceed numbers, and they could literally race to the bottom in real time. That sounds like it's kind of slow, but is that what's the, what you're act, uh, thinking about? Yeah, so 
so there will be government <coughs> evaluation teams like you would experience with any task order uh, competition process. Where we do have some automation is not in the competitions themselves, but rather the building of the acquisition process, which the acquisition process can be a little bit cumbersome. So as mission partners put together the different pieces of their packages, and that is what is provided to the uh, contractors to compete, but the competition process itself will use evaluation teams and isn't automated. It, it includes all the subjectivity and all of the critical consideration that you would expect with the competition. So let's talk about the middleware layer that's going to adjudicate which cloud you pop into for your use case. Is that where the vendor lock is going to occur, or where are you most afraid of vendor lock occurring? So I think from a vendor lock perspective, what's important is how the application itself is built. Applications can be built vendor agnostic, and this goes towards the increasing maturity of the department, making sure that, uh, for instance, uh, there's opportunities, I think, in this arena for systems integrators to partner with mission partners to help them build their applications in a way that is more vendor agnostic so that they can move their data around the different cloud environments and be able to have that portability. Okay, Tony Capascio from Bloomberg. I know you're on the line. Tony? Yeah, th thank you. You touched on my subject a little bit here. The stories last night when they first came out implied there was a split, that our, all four vendors would get a split of the $9 billion. Can you walk us through how many task orders are in the three-year base and the fact that all four contractors are not going to get guaranteed $2 billion splits, that they're going to have to compete in each task order how many task orders are there in the first, in the base, and then in the, in the final two option years? I'll go ahead take that one. Um, so it, it's a shared ceiling of $9 billion. Um, each of the vendors is guaranteed $100,000 as, as part of, of the contract. And each of the task orders, um, we, we don't have a specific number of task orders because it's all based on the, on the number of mission requirements uh, that, that our mission partners have. So that the, the task orders, that there, there's not really a number that you can put on it. It's really it's based on that ceiling of $9 billion that's shared among the four, um, four CSPs. Okay, so, so to be clear, though, sir, each when you, the, the word split implies they're all going to get a split of the $9 billion. That's not accurate. They have to compete for a share of that money. Yes, they have to compete for a share of the, of the shared $9 billion ceiling with each one of them guaranteed $100,000 as part of the contract. Thanks for clarifying that. Thanks so much for doing this. Following up on this conversation, with vendors having to compete for every order, is there potential that the competitions will slow down the process to the point where it makes this vehicle unusable, or how do you counteract that potential? So we've been working really hard to be innovative in our task order competition process. There is flexibility within the acquisition process to, for instance, use that automation tool to put together the package itself. And as part of that process, too, DISA is positioned to provide advice and guidance uh, as we become you know, more familiar with what that process looks like. The other thing I'd offer on that one is, is I think, we have a great relationship with the CSPs, and so as we work together, we will figure out you know, innovative ways to, to make sure that, we, that, that, that the speed of need is there for our warfighters. And a quick follow-up, does this have any plans for an initial candidate or an initiative that will sort of be used as a first mover as these task forces are, or task orders are awarded? We, we are, we're continuing to work with our, our mission partners across the department, and we, we've identified multiple ones that, uh, that could be candidates, and we're working through the specific details. Back here in the room, Chris Gordon. Chris Gordon, Air and Space Forces Magazine. The cloud enables interoperability, efficiency, but it seems like there's going to need to be a culture shift uh, among the services to get to a point where they're sharing and also a shift in the acquisition process to actually make that happen. So it seems like there's a lot of capability here, but how are you actually going to make some of the necessary changes and how the DOD operates to enable what cloud services can provide. I'll start briefly, maybe turn it to Lily and then my other colleagues here. This gets to what we talked about, about the greater cloud conversancy that we have throughout the department with what we call fit for purpose clouds. 
like Sea Army, Cloud One, Black Pearl, and others, as as the department has learned how to. And using cloud is not just putting workloads in this cloud. It's how do you fund it? How do you do software development in the cloud? And many other key steps that have been well underway for the past several years. But your question about as we move towards an enterprise framework here, which is really what JADC2 is about, and why having JWCC now is so critical to be that that binding element here, that compute capability that really spans the entire enterprise, which we haven't had before, that is a bit of a culture shift. And my experiences in the intelligence community, for example, we talk a lot about this. This, this is a journey to get there, to work with our military department colleagues, the combatant commands, the defense agencies and field activities, to lead the cultural piece of this is just as important as a technical. Lily, would you like to add anything to that? Absolutely. Um, to follow up with what Mr. Sherman said, uh, the threat and the requirements drive us to the things that you talk about where we're going to have to be joint, integrated, and we can't miss a step or time. So really what JWCC buys us is speed, scale, security, in order to be able to do something like a zero trust this is it. We're going to have to have the diversity of uh, cloud capabilities and the providers and the uh, technology as it evolves. Um, it's going to have to give us, uh, we're going to have to be able to do monitoring of uh, the whole environment. We're going to have to be able to do uh, automation. All of these capabilities are going to uh, need this type of a multi-cloud enterprise level um, site site uh, and access. So I think where we're heading and the environment we're in is going to drive us to the um, uh, to, to using JWCC. Can I just ask a quick follow-up on a point, point you made, sir, um, on resilience. Um, how are you going to decide what systems are zero fail, you know, 99% uptime, that's presumably going to be more expensive? and systems that aren't as critical but enable it to be, be cheaper. How are you going to get at that aspect? Because it seems to me if, if everything is, is zero fail, you could, you could end up with very expensive contracts. Well, so, um, I think it's all based on the priority of, of our warfighters. Um, and as our combatant commands continue to identify those key terrain, that key terrain, key areas that are critical to their warfighting mission, that's how we kind of help prioritize uh, as we move forward. Okay, John Harper. Um, by picking uh, all four vendors that were invited to bid on this, do you think you've essentially made JWCC protest proof, and to what extent did that influence your decision to, to pick all the vendors? Well, um, I, I, as you know, with, with any contract, a protest is possible. Uh, what we really focused on was here are the requirements that the department needs, and based on those requirements, we did an evaluation, we did market research, we did evaluation to see which uh, CSPs, U.S.-based CSPs, were able to meet those requirements, and that's how we made the the decision. The, the decision of based on whether it was a protest or not really did play into it because we wanted to focus on the requirements and who could meet those requirements. And when we begin uh, uh, the bids for these specific TAF scores, do you have a time frame for that? The, the task order process can begin in 15 days from the contract award. Okay, I'm going to go back to the phone lines. Uh, Lauren Williams of Defense One. Hi, thank you for doing this. I'm curious to understand your plans on integrating JWCC with the, the military departments. I know a lot of them have their own major cloud efforts already underway. And I'm just curious if there's going to be a complementary effort or if there's going to be a competition there because people will be able to choose between the ones that already exist and, and this new capability. Um, just to be clear, JWC is not in competition with, with, with the, the current cloud offerings. It's complementary. It is to make sure that we have best value for a whole bunch of different requirements from the multi-classification um, to the strategic to tactical. And the, the current cloud offerings, um, if they are meeting those mission requirements, then the, the, the services will, will continue to use those. What I would offer is as, as these contracts come up for rebid and or 
um, then what we'll do is we'll look at from a best value standpoint uh, what is the best vehicle to to take care of that and we think uh, based on the great work that the team has done within JWCC that it, it, it will provide be best value uh, but it is complementary to the to the other cloud offerings and, co and contracts okay moving on to Jared Subaru of Federal News Network hello I just wanted to clarify a little bit on the ordering process it, it sounded like early on in this process, the thinking was that individual vendors would not even really get the opportunity to bid, so to speak, on each individual order in real time, but that the evaluation would all happen in-house and you would just be placing orders against their existing price sheets. Is, is that basically still right or is that process changed? I would restate the process differently. So all of the vendors will be invited to submit proposals for the task orders, and then the government evaluation teams will evaluate those proposals. So it will be a fair opportunity to compete uh, for all of the different task orders. Jasper Gill, are you online from Breaking Defense? Can I do a quick follow, Jessica? Jared, do your follow-up, please. Sorry, I didn't know if you heard me. Uh, uh, does that extend what you think the average order evaluation process is going to be? I think the thinking was five to 10 days per order before. Is that still right? I think we need to work through the specifics. We'll discover that as we go through the initial task orders. But like I had said before, we really spent a lot of time looking at leveraging some of the flexibility in the task order fair opportunity process. So we'll see how that bears out. Um, but really, the critical point is that the task orders will be available to all the vendors to compete. OK, Jasper, please, if you have a question. Hi, yeah, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, I was just wondering if you can talk about the timelines with JWCC and clarify some stuff. So when it was announced um, that it was being delayed, um, I think it was said that 2026 would be the full and open competition. And then the contract award yesterday said work would be done in 2028. So if I could just, if you guys can just clarify the timeline surrounding this. Sure. So the contract was awarded today and or yesterday, and it was a three year base period with two one year options. So if all the options are exercised, it's a potential five year period of time. And all four vendors will be on those contracts and have an opportunity to compete for the task orders. Does that answer your question? Jasper, does that answer your question? You have a follow up? Yeah, I guess I was just kind of um, confused about the 2026 time frame that was mentioned um, a few, I think it was like last month or whenever the announcement came out. Yeah. Um, I, I'd have to look at the, I, I think it really boils down to, you know, we have um, base years and then we have um, option years. And based on how the, the, the contract is satisfying the, the, the needs, we, we will continue on. Um, there will be a full and open competition at some point in time in the future based on the, the mission requirements and where the department is at that time. And if you look at what got posted on the contract piece last night on the DOD website, it, 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 so it said June 28, which I thought where you're going with the math here, and how do you get to June 28? So you have a three-year base, two one-year options, with a potential six month extension. So if you add all that together and we're in December of 22 here, that's how you potentially get all the way out to June, 2028. So I just wanted to clarify the math on that, but that's, and, and so I'm not sure where the, on the 2026 piece, we could take that offline, but that's where we, on the announcement yesterday, it talked about 2028 as the potential most extensive uh, place to where this could go time-wise. And, and if the department decided to um, not, uh, do the option years, then we would have to start a little bit earlier from an acquisition yeah. standpoint to get to get the team set up. So that may be where you're talking about the, the other dates is uh, at some point in time, we have to backdate how long it would take to do a full and open competition as part of a, this effort. Okay, moving on to Frank Conkel of NextGov on the phone Thanks. line. Yeah, so can you guys clarify that in a sort of a best case scenario, ideal world, how quickly could a task order be issued, responded to and, and filled? Um, and then uh, piggybacking on that, can these individual task orders be protested as well or not? 
So we're hoping task order competition process can be counted in weeks or maybe a few months, but we need to work through the specifics and we'll learn as we go in the beginning. Under the acquisition rules, the, the task orders, there's a, a $10 million threshold and a $25 million threshold on protests. Uh, so it's really dependent on how large the task order is. Cool, and, and following up, is there an on-ramp or off-ramp for new vendors that might come along in the next five years or vendors on this contract that perform poorly where you can kind of add or subtract as time goes on? So there's a couple of pieces to that. Um, there isn't an on or off ramp, so to speak. Uh, you know, all four vendors will be provided an opportunity to compete for the task orders, which means they need to be competitive for those requirements. And I think the fair opportunity competition process will, will bear that out. If for some reason, like General Skinner was saying, the department wanted to go in a different direction, we would just need to start the follow-on competition, the full and open competition sooner, and we have that flexibility. Okay, back in the room, Kimberly from Signal Magazine. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Kimberly Underwood from FC International Signal, Signal Magazine. Excuse me. <clears throat> Can you talk about, I think initially you thought about offering the contract to two vendors at least and happily to see four that will give you more competition. Are we to understand that those four companies can all provide a certain baseline of services, especially at higher security levels, like impact level six um, and top secret level? Yeah. Oh, the, um, so the, uh, as part of the contract, each of the CSPs has to be able to provide the, the unclassified capability today, um, SIPRNET within 60 days, and then top secret within 180 days. I think it's a follow up. How, how did you verify or, or how happy were, were you with kind of kicking the tires to make sure that um, those other two or maybe all of them can provide um, cloud services at that top, le top secret level? I would just say our technical review was very thorough um, throughout the acquisition process, and that's probably about all, all I'll say on that. Is just we, we did a lot of extensive uh, review, understanding, and discussions with this, with each of the CSPs to yeah. make sure that we were comfortable and confident. And the one thing I would add, when we I had announced back in the March time frame that we weren't going to be awarding in April of 2022, but needed to get to December to now, that's the kind of due diligence the team did under Ms. Woods and Mr. Ryan MacArthur here to make sure they kind of measure twice, cut once sort of approach on this, getting exactly those sort of due diligence issues. Back in the room. Chris Anderson, AWPS News. Um, so just from the general public's perspective, um, a moment to foot stamp, foot stomp, um, how critical this technology will be to everything else that the department is doing. So that when the general public looks at that big number, that big dollar number, they understand how important this is to everything else. And then um, in terms of adoption across the whole enterprise, uh, will, are there other efforts that will help that process move forward? And do you have a sense of how long that might take? And then a third question would be, um, just when the next big whiz bang thing comes along, is there a way to get that in? If it turns out that during this period between now and 2028, uh, you know, there's a vendor out there, the small independent vendor or something like that, who has this really terrific idea. Um, is there a way to incorporate that into so that the military is always on the cutting edge? Not the bleeding edge, but the cutting edge. I'll take the first one and then maybe defer to my colleagues on the other two. <laughs> I was going to say this in my closing remarks, but I'll say this now. As we look at our pacing challenge of China, the PRC, I've said this often, that our American industry and technology in the digital space is really what gives us a leg up. And being able to work with these four cloud service providers who are world class, to be able to help our warfighters, our women and men in uniform, as well as the civilians and others who support them, and working with allies too, by the way, to be able to make sense of their environment and to be able to make calculations and be able to live and excel and maneuver and fight and win in a digital environment that's what this cloud computing provides now i know at the average when you go out to the public folks who maybe don't work in the tech sector cloud maybe sounds like an esoteric term what is it for it is an ability to make sense and be able to decide quicker than your adversary is able to decide be able to understand the information around our commanders and others who have to be able to act very quickly in a very 21st century environment 
against a very capable pacing challenge. That's why this is so important at, at the base level. We could talk about infrastructure and computing and task orders and workloads. This is decision advantage is what these four cloud service providers help provide us and to be able to unlock our data too and be able to do amazing things in software and elsewhere. So I'll defer to you. Can you state your second question just real quick again, please? Uh, the second question would be the efforts underway to help the department adopt uh, the new technology and make best use of it. How quickly and do you have a sense and are there efforts underway to just help the department realize the, uh, the positive benefits? Sure, yeah. go I, ahead, Bob. I, I, I would just say um, the innovative spirit in the Department of Defense and the nation is alive and well. And I'm confident that our mission partners, along with our cloud service providers and, and, uh, and us, are, are gonna find unique and innovative ways that we haven't even thought about today of being able to leverage this, this, this capability. And so I, I, I'm very confident and I'm excited to, to see that happen. Um, and, and it's going to be, ha it's happening, you know, by the week, by the month, and, and by the year. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. And if I can add to that, I'd like to turn to Ms. Zelicki. She leads many different types of forums. It is a team effort here, working with the military services, the joint staff, the combatant commands, the many defense agencies and field activities to work together to unlock this technology. But can you speak to that briefly? Yes, sir. Um, so we do have uh, many initiatives uh, that are going to leverage this from uh, software modernization to um, cloud migration um, and the ability to make it work for a hybrid environment, as you all s pointed out, because we have existing capabilities, many of them, and these are going to have to either uh, migrate to the cloud or coexist and or operate. Uh, so innovation is critical in this you're absolutely right and i believe jwcc is the fulcrum to uh, enable us to do that and it is uh, honestly it's going to complete all, all of our existing uh, cloud capabilities it is not only complementary it completes it and it's it's going to open the door to evolve further so you're absolutely right. And if I can add one other thing on that, working closely with my colleague, Dr. Craig Martell, the Chief Digital and AI Officer, of the right. CDAO, um, you, many of you have been reporting on what he's doing with JADC2 and the key role CDAO is going to have with that. The integrated data layer is critical to JADC2, and JWCC is the mechanism that's going to enable that. And moreover, the AI and Data Accelerator Initiative, or ADA, as we talk about unlocking AI and data at the combatant commands will be very reliant on JWCC to make that a reality. So there's a whole piece of this working with CDAO as well that needs JWCC. And ma'am, if you could ask your third question again, please. Um, outside of the four primary vendors, if, if it turns out that there is somebody out there who has a really better, gee whiz, big bang idea, is there a way to integrate that from the outside? Sharon, would you like yeah, to Yeah, sure. So there will be a, a, a full and open follow-on competition after the JWCC contract is complete. We have flexibility on when we start that process. So if industry changes, we see something that we want to go after, we can start that process earlier into the JWCC contract execution. Josh. Good afternoon, Josh Axrod, Bloomberg Government. Uh, the solicitation for this contract mentioned DOD was aware of uh, just five U.S.-based hyperscale cloud providers. Why was the fifth not invited to bid? So we took a hard look at the marketplace and we did our due diligence with the proposals. And so ultimately it came down to, uh, based on our analysis, who could best meet the requirements. And can I confirm, is that non awardee IBM? IBM was not invited to the proposal process. Okay, going back to the phone lines, uh, Ashley Bellinger of Ars Technica. Ashley? Ashley, are you online? Okay, anyone else in the... Oh, Louie Martinez, ABC, Louie. Um, good afternoon. Um, do other nations' militaries have this capability? I mean, I, I heard you talk about the pacing challenge, but I mean, that's the generic mention in this, that this department refers to, but is there a pacing challenge with China for this cloud capability uh, for JWCC? I mean, it, does it 
Are you leagues ahead of where the rest of the world is, and is there a concern that other nations may get this, or where are we in this? I think cloud computing and what it brings to the fight is being used all over the world, whether it's with our allies, who we absolutely rely on, or pacing challenges and potential adversaries. And being able to stay ahead in this digital space, to what I said, leveraging U.S. companies that are world leaders on this is what we absolutely have to have to be able to stay ahead of these pacing challenges and others. So to your question, if this is something we cannot rest on, and JWCC is, is our jump forward on this to using the best that the industry has to offer, I would argue throughout the world, and not doing so would be derelict on our part to be able to leverage something and also at the enterprise level. Not just what we have now, but being able, as I noted at the beginning, that stretches all the way from continental United States to that tactical edge, wherever that happens to be, at all three security classification levels. So obviously we can't get into classified what we know about other nations, but this puts us where we need to be as a Department of Defense and protecting what we need to protect. Cloud is not... I'm sorry, Bob, oh, do you want to I, add something? I would just say cloud is not unique. What I would offer is the, the the secret sauce is the partnerships that we have with our cloud service providers yeah. um, and the department and that innovative spirit. I think that's what sets us apart, and, and I think we're we're we're, we're very confident in, in in our abilities and the resiliency and the readiness that that, that this will bring for the department. Sure. Did you have a and, and does it set you far enough apart that you're way ahead of competitors? That would require almost a net assessment of this, but I can tell you, a CIO. I'm confident we're doing the right thing here to put us on the right path we need in the not only 2020s, but as we move forward on this to get us on the right foot with that. So that's what I would say there. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Sean Carberry, National Defense Magazine. So I mean, there's a certain level of abstraction to, to this conversation. Can you kind of put it a little bit more visually? So there's U.S. forces in Syria right now prosecuting a campaign against ISIS. How is this going to manifest at their level? What kinds of things can they do with what will be built out that they can't do today? You know, give it the extent to which you can, a little bit more concrete example of how people in this building will be affected by this, how people at the tactical edge will be affected by what you're building. Well, I, I would just say it, it, it is the, the speed of decision making and the speed of information um, leveraging it, it, and you can't just look at it from just as the cloud you have to look at it as how the information is getting from these cloud location points which are globally um, down to the tactical edge which which is contract vehicle uh, enables looking at that is the individuals at the foxhole to to our strategic decision makers it's this information these applications that are churning out the right information at the right time at the right level that enables us to have that decision advantage that Mr. Sherman talked about, but also to allows us to have that tactical advantage. And so it's just, it, it speeds up the game for our war fighters and our mission partners in, in order for them to, to do their mission. And to be able to have cloud computing capabilities, and you mentioned Syria, it could be anywhere else, where you're not having to backhaul a lot of data, but you're able to have this sort of capability out at that quote tactical edge, and I noted that in my opening remarks, that's a very important aspect of JWCC where we're not only working with these vendors as you know as we launch this, but we're going to be pushing hard to really continue to develop those capabilities because that's where it's going to be most needed. I don't know if Sharon or someone else would like to add to that. I would just offer to think about it from the warfighters' perspective that they need to be able to collect data and process data at the point of need. And so the tactical edge capabilities that we've been discussing, it takes cloud and puts it into a smaller form factor that becomes portable. And so that can go with the warfighter as opposed to having to do the backhaul uh, that, that Honorable Sherman was just mentioning. Okay, we have time for two more questions. I'm gonna go to you, then back to you, John. So. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Sandra Irwin with Space News. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, rolled out a, a strategy for artificial intelligence, for the use of artificial intelligence. Um, and I was wondering um, if you can talk about the uh, support that this, this, these cloud providers can bring into that strategy. Um, we heard from DOD that one of the limiting factors is that there's not enough cloud computing capability. Do you think this helps um, 
advance the artificial intelligence strategy? Absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, working with my colleague, Dr. Craig Martell, the Chief Digital and AI Officer, JWCC has been a missing critical piece of what he needs to do on the AI and data front. Not only for compute power, but that integrated data layer I've mentioned that will support joint all domain command and control. But to have that ecosystem at all three security classifications that we just went over here, uh, to be able to provide that and uh, to really accelerate us along on AI. And these cloud service providers, each in their own right, have done a lot in terms of AI and machine learning capabilities that this will give us an ability to tap into as well as part of JWCC. Bob, I don't know if you'd add to that. No, that's perfect. Okay. Are, they, are the vendors actually supporting you with like technical support for AI? Well, we just, as we're just now launching on this contract journey with them, these are going to be the kind of interactions we have with them. But Sharon, I don't know if you would like to amplify that. Well, and I would say there are artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities that are native to the cloud environments themselves. So by having direct contract awards with the vendors, it gives us a great opportunity to partner with them and really learn about that technology. Okay, John, you have the last question. Um, will U.S. allies and partners be able to leverage this JWCC capability, or will it be restricted to just the U.S. military and DOD? Well, uh, we're going to be able to uh, do uh, work with the combatant commands and um, the mission partner environment where it's going to enable uh, us to communicate and leverage this capability uh, uh, to collaborate with our mission partners. So in a way, yeah, it will allow um, for them to be able to use the capabilities through our uh, combatant commands sure. and the Sharon, military. would you like to add anything to that? No, I, I think that that's right. Okay. That concludes the briefing. We're going to close it with some closing remarks, sir. So um, answering the one comment in the back, you kind of got to what I was going to say, but I'm going to say it again. This really is working with these cloud service providers, providing this capability is so needed for the department to be able to stay ahead of the PRC and what we need to do in enabling our, our joint force. Um, I think we said um, a lot of the main points here today, so I won't rehash them, but I just want to again publicly thank the team who has worked so hard to get us to where we are to be able to make this award last night and be able to talk to you about it here today. I got one other little piece of news I want to say. This is not related to JWCC, but I'm proud to announce Ms. Lily Zalecki here. Is she's had acting in front of her name as a deputy CIO IE. She is the deputy CIO IE here as of this week. So we will uh, be putting a formal announcement, but because she's up at the desk here with us, I wanted to recognize her as the, uh, the deputy CIO for that portfolio. I thank you for your time today, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. That concludes today's briefing. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.